Good evening. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be getting started shortly. Hi, how are you? I'm blessing yourself. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for joining us. No problem. Thank you guys for having us today. So I'm just getting a few of our other guests on. Hi, how are you? We're good. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to let a few folks come in the chat and then we'll have our, hopefully we'll have our last guest on shortly. Um, but for those of you who are coming in, um, thank you so much for tuning in tonight to tonight's Justice Now conversation. Please feel free to drop us a comment. Let us know where you're dialing in from. Um, and we'll be getting started shortly. Welcome, everyone. Okay, we have folks from Tallahassee, Richmond, Virginia. Okay. And I think I think we have a full house. <laughs> Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, so. I am Jerrica Richardson, uh, and I serve as a Senior Vice President for Equitable Justice and Strategic Initiatives at the National Urban League. And so I am so excited to uh, welcome all of our viewers into tonight's Justice Now conversation. Uh, we are here to talk about voting rights, specifically for citizens that are either in currently incarcerated in the system or those who have uh, formerly been incarcerated, and really the challenges, um, some of the hurdles, some of the barriers, we really want this to be an informative conversation. And so I'm excited to have really three distinguished guests on with me tonight who have been doing great work in the public service arena and the advocacy arena on this very specific issue. Um, so I'm going to start out, you all have very impressive bio, and I want to just give everyone a little bit about your background. Um, so first, we are joined by Representative Liz Miranda, who is soon to be Senator Miranda <laughs> uh, from the great state of Massachusetts. Um, Representative Miranda represents Suffolk, the Suffolk District of Roxbury and Dorchester in Massachusetts. Uh, we are also joined by Marquise McKenzie, uh, who is the organizing director for Florida Right Restoration Coalition. Uh, and um, Marquise is also the founder and president of Community Outreach Enterprise. And finally, we have Rodricia Russo, sorry, Russo, who is not only a feminist activist and a human rights defender, she is working as the executive director of the Ordinary People Society and has played a critical role in organizing and mobilizing communities across the deep south. Uh, so look, needless to say, we have um, a great list of speakers joining us to talk about this really important issue. Um, so welcome to all of you. Good night. Um, and so, um, Marquise, I actually want to start with you, and, I, and this question is for the entire panel. Um, so when we're talking about uh, some of the challenges for those who are um, citizens who are either incarcerated or formerly incarcerated, I would love to hear from you a little bit about your work, um, how you're engaging in this space, um, and, you know, why is it so important for uh, folks in this community to be educated, in our community, be educated about these issues, uh, and really to put them to the forefront of our mind when we're thinking about civic engagement and voting rights. Yep. So, uh, again, my name is Mark Keith with Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. We're the group that's responsible for passing Amendment 4 in the state of Florida. So for 150 years in the state of Florida, if you have a felony conviction, you lost all of your rights for life. 
right? And that disenfranchised a lot of people in the quarter. It's very important that we keep the community engaged and educated because almost everyone, right, is somewhat directly impacted or have a family member that's been formerly incarcerated or just currently incarcerated. And when you talk about creating a, a better justice in society, right, and when you talk about creating safer communities, one of the ways that we found is a way to do that is by strengthening the ones who was weakened. And what we're seeing in the state of Florida, the ones who are the most weakened are the ones that's going through the criminal justice system. And if we want them to come back on and be a productive citizen, it's only right that we get involved, create opportunities, and provide resources. And we can do that by simply by voting. And voting has a lot of power because a lot of our elected officials can decide if they're going to put resources behind those individuals coming out and crossing. Um, well, thank you so much, Marquise. And, and I think it's important because you are not only talking the talk, you know, you are walking the walk too in your work every day uh, and, and, and with your experience with the system. And so I look forward to hearing more from you uh, in this conversation. Um, I want to pause. I feel, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. So um, if folks can mute their mics when they're not talking, I don't know if there's something else that might be open to see if that does it. Maybe the feedback is me. I will mute myself. <laughs> um, but uh, why don't we pass it along to uh, the senator-elect, and then Rodrisha will head over to you next. If you all can just share a little bit about your work in this space. Um, thank you so much. Uh, this is such an honor of mine, and I'm looking forward to joining Florida, hopefully when I'm in my first term in the Senate uh, to end fel felony uh, disenfranchisement in Massachusetts. My road um, to electoral politics is every reason why I actually work um, on this issue. So I grew up in Roxbury, Bobby Brown's Roxbury here uh, in Massachusetts. It's the heart of the black community, not only in the city of Boston, but the entire state. And my entire male side of my family was incarcerated. Uh, my father and my eldest brother were incarcerated, then deported. Uh, my second oldest brother uh, was still incarcerated uh, when I became elected in 2018. And my youngest brother, after doing uh, two bids uh, in sort of um, the county uh, jail system here in, in Boston, was actually killed and he was the sort of catalyst for me running for office. So I say to people all the time, although I've won three elections, um, that I've been a Roxbury girl for 42 years of my life. And when you live in a community that is over-policed, over-incarcerated, uh, when we make up less than 20% of the state of Massachusetts population, and that's black and brown people, uh, Latino mainly, and black people in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, yet make up 67% to 70% of the state's prison population. This is obviously about race and racism. We are not inherently more violent, uh, but we are disproportionately impacted and have been so by all of the policies that are made in places like Beacon Hill, where I work. And so there's a very lived experience for why I work on this issue. Um, but disenfranchisement didn't start uh, in the 80s uh, with the war on drugs. It actually started uh, in 1619, uh, when Black people were forced uh, from their African countries and brought here in the transatlantic slave trade. And throughout history, whether you're looking at the suffrage movement uh, that guaranteed the right to vote for white women, there have always been rights to vote for white land-holding Protestant men. Um, however, everybody else was disenfranchised, and it took us uh, many, many years before we were enfranchised. So this voting uh, piece is a way for Black communities to inherently be seen as humans and be given the dignity as full citizens of this country. And so I work on this issue because regardless of you being incarcerated or returning back to society or having family members incarcerated or community members like myself, um, having people in large parts of your community not being able to exercise their rights impacts us all. Thank you so much, Senator-elect, and thank you for giving us the background and the history lesson. I, I mean, I think it's important for folks to know that we just, this issue didn't just start recently. It isn't just 
a new problem that we need to address. It is really embedded into the fabric of this country and and really um, what we've been struggling with, which is racism. So thank you for that. Uh, Rodrisha? I think you're breaking up a little bit. Are you able to come closer to the mic? You still can't hear me? Um, I think I we're... Think. Go ahead, try again one more time. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. A little bit better? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, you all. Um, my name is Rodricia Russo. I'm the executive director of the Ordinary People Society. I'm also um, the leader of um, Voices of the Violated Reproductive Justice Project. Um, that is aiming to end the trauma to prison pipeline. And so I'm excited to be here. Um, well, the reason why we basically are pushing this issue, of ending mass incarceration, and especially um, speaking to Black communities, and particularly of color, about their voting rights is because we believe that you're not a citizen in so you have your voting rights. You know, you're not, you, you, even though you may have your birth certificate, Social Security card that does not make you a citizen in the United States. What makes you a citizen is the right to vote. And there's a lot of folks that are formerly incarcerated who have lost their right to vote or should have never lost their right to vote. In 2008, um, by Pastor Glasgow, Glasgow versus Alabama lawsuit was one for moral turpitude that nobody should um, that has a crime not involving moral turpitude they should be eligible to vote. And so in 2007, there was law change in Florida as well um, that he was involved with. And so we are working deep here in the South to educate those in and outside, uh, restoring their dignity and their rights, letting all the community know, listen, you're, you, this does not become an issue for you until it's in your backyard. And every issue is a voting issue. And many folks feel like they're not directly impacted. And we're here to tell you, no, that's not true. When you look in your family line, somebody is impacted by mass incarceration or will be at the rate that we're growing, will be impacted by mass incarceration. So it is very important that we understand that the rights to vote is also your freedom when you're coming, in, coming from serving your time. Um, thank you for that. I think it's a really important point. I want to um, really just um, kind of lift up for this conversation um, some facts. So with the exception of Vermont, Maine, and Washington, D.C., and if we're talking about states, right, because Washington, D.C. is just a district, except for Vermont and Maine, um, every state currently disenfranchises people convicted of felonies while they are incarcerated. Uh, now there are some exceptions for folks that are detained, so they're incarcerated, so they're in jail. Uh, they may not have been convicted of an offense uh, yet at the time. And so there are some states that have um, made uh, some efforts to get make sure that they have the opportunity to vote um, in, in, uh, while they're in the facility um, or via absentee, so states like Chicago, Illinois, so the Cook County Jail has done that, uh, the D.C. Central Detention Facility, the Denver County Jail, um, Harris County Jail in Houston, Texas, uh, Central Region Regional Detention Facility in Los Angeles, California, and the Will County Detention Center in uh, Joliet, Illinois. So while there are some spaces and places where we are seeing movement and are seeing folks that may be incarcerated or detained, um, really having at least the opportunity to exercise their right to vote. I mean, that's just a small drop in the bucket when we're talking about the millions of people in this country that are, are, are either incarcerated or have been incarcerated at some point in time. Uh, and so recently, if we, um, if we look to the Biden administration, there was an executive order that promoted access to voting and it expanded rights 
um, voting rights to eligible citizens that were in federal custody. Uh, but I think some would argue that the executive order really failed to address some of the logistical barriers that we're seeing for folks that are incarcerated um, when they're trying to register or get access uh, to a ballot or to the ballot box where they are. And so I want to really just kind of um, throw, you know, throw a question out to the panel and feel free to uh, jump in and, um, you know, I really want this to kind of be a very free flowing conversation. Um, so I'd love to hear from you all about uh, what you've seen in your work, what you've experienced about some of the barriers uh, to voting for those um, that are incarcerated. But I also want to hear about some of the barriers that you've seen and experienced for those folks um, who are returning citizens who have paid their debt to society and are really just trying to engage in democracy, um, which we all know is fundamental uh, to who we are and what we stand for here in this country in America. So either Marquise or uh, Senator-elect Miranda, I'm just gonna keep saying it because we're so <laughs> excited for you in 2023. It sounds great. <laughs> Please feel free to jump in. Um, Marquise, ladies first. point ladies. of privilege to go first, if that's okay. No, ladies first. Uh, oh, sure, okay. Um, you know, when we make up less than 4.5% of state legislatures across the country, and here in Massachusetts, Black women only make up 2% in this liberal state of the state legislatures, it's really incredibly important because all of our state laws, uh, and, you know, I like to... Uh, to highlight something the other speaker mentioned, that every issue is a voting issue. What I want to tell people is every issue is a Black issue. Um, and when you mentioned the states of Vermont and Maine uh, being the only two states, they happen to be the two whitest states in the, the Constitution of the United States. And, and so what is that is saying is that as long as your prison population is majority white, uh, you can have the right to vote. And so most of the states, the other 48, are dealing with the issues that Massachusetts is dealing with. And so I'd like to share some facts around um, this movement, but I wanna shout out a couple of people that are here. Um, I worked a lot on this legislation with a couple important organizations. One is the African American Coalition um, behind bars. So there's a group of men. We have 15 Department of Correction facilities in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And those brothers uh, have been on a policy issue that impact those that are currently incarcerated and those returning back to society. And when I passed the jail-based voting uh, bill here in Massachusetts last year, which does not include, sadly, felony enfranchisement, but it helps eight to 10,000 people who are in pretrial detention or serving a misdemeanor uh, get the right access and the availability to the right to vote. Uh, they were leading on that in this cold called democracy behind bars. And so one of the issues is that folks behind bars don't always get to talk to legislators. And it's uh, something that I want to suggest to people is that ensuring that folks that are incarcerated are forming these groups and have the permission to engage um, with people on the outside uh, to help uh, shape the policy decisions that will impact them. The second is that everybody that is voting is voting for someone that is making the laws that it can either cause harm or improving uh, different policy areas, right? And so particularly if you care about the issue of reentry, or ending mass incarceration, you should be engaging with your state representatives and state senators. Uh, many of the states that have the worst outcomes are because they do not hold the majority in their House or Senate, and um, they're largely Black uh, states. And so we need to figure out how we're actually moving the needle with the legislative bodies. And a lot of people care about presidential elections and they care about local elections, but when it comes to state elections, a lot of folks are tapped out and some of those people are the most important people. But access is what we've been sharing uh, to folks that if folks are incarcerated, how do they get 
access to an absentee ballot? Um, are there polling locations in uh, these facilities? No, they're not. Are there polling locations very close? Here in the state of Massachusetts, I'll end here. Another big issue is we had a really beautiful race in the primary uh, with my soror, Tanisha Sullivan, who was trying to be the new Secretary of State. Many of us have outdated offices that are leading and not leading in the spaces of voter enfranchisement or stewarding uh, the Black vote in our communities. And so those are one of the uh, most important races as Secretary of State and those people in those positions. How are they interacting with our communities and all citizens of the Commonwealth? And so those are three ways um, that we've been able to solve some of these challenges, but we've also seen a huge issue with access, education, and stewardship of the Black vote, whether they're incarcerated or in community. And for folks who were returning back to society, if you didn't have access to the ballot while you were incarcerated, whether it was five years or five months or 15 years, it's very unlikely that when you return to community that you actually think you have the right to vote. Uh, and so I registered over 500 formerly incarcerated people in my election uh, because of my lived experience, but I understood that they were coming back to communities like mine and for them to feel like full citizens, uh, they needed access to the right to vote. Um, so thank you. And thank you for that. Um, you know, Marquise, I would love to to go to you um, as we're talking, especially, you know, the last point we're talking about returning citizens. There's so many things that I think are top of mind. Folks think of housing, you know, helping folks get jobs and opportunities. But we need to make sure that making sure that folks are eligible to vote, they understand how they can uh, get back the vote and engage in the process is part of that public education we do. You want to talk a little bit more about that uh, and how we kind of get over some of the barriers that folks are experiencing? Yeah, definitely. Um, and definitely want to address one of the questions that I've seen in the comment. Um, someone said, you know, how has FRC responded to the voter fraud arrest? Um, and I'm glad to be a part of the organization. And instead of us playing politics and going back and forth uh, with certain politicians pertaining to this situation, um, we just jumped and we started a legal defense fund and a bail fund that would help anyone who get arrested or also provide lawyers for anyone who need the representation, right? Um, we know that if we would have played those politics games and go back and forth, or how quickly those individuals get shoved away and sent to prison. So we like to engage and make sure that our members are put at the first front. And again, instead of going back and forth with politicians, what it is that we're seeing, right, when you're talking about voter suppression, for so many years, people forgot and abandoned formerly incarcerated people, right? They also forgot and abandoned those who were directly impacted. And for many years, they never talked about our issues. They didn't care about the prison conditions. So of course, when they realized that how we cover the gap becomes a big problem, how the returning citizen population, not just in Florida, but across the world, becomes a voting, a voting block, it becomes an issue. And of course, every little thing that can be put in front of us is going to stop or try to at least stop us. I'll give you a clear example. In the state of Florida, our governor elections is decided by 30,000 votes. When we passed Amendment 4, that allowed over 1.4 million returning citizens to be able to vote in the state of Florida. So you have 30,000 people that it takes to win an election, you have 1.4 million that can currently vote. We can easily change the direction of any election, the governor race, county commissioner race, judges races. And the point, what we try to do is just engage all of our returning citizens and their family members about these local races. Because again, you have the governor races that are, that are very important, right? But when you talk about on a local level, you have the sheriff races, right? Who controls the jails of much of in most of these counties. You have the state attorney, right? You have judges that sit on the boards for many years and never go and contest it, but that's because our people wasn't educated. So we're big on giving education out because a lot of people want to vote, but they don't vote because they don't know how to. And that's the reason why they stay away from the polls, because they're not educated. I think that's an important po point um, that you lifted up. We're talking about a voting block. Uh, and so uh, it makes so much sense why sometimes we see the challenges erected, because really, these, these millions of people that have had their rights stripped in some way, shape, or form, and some 
maybe are having them restored, really have the power to swing elections. Um, and I'm glad, Marquise, that you brought up what has been happening in Florida. Uh, I think it's something that we've seen on the ground in the Urban League. Um, we need to make sure that we're doing what we can uh, to get some messaging out around that. Um, because although uh, it is problematic, I think some of the numbers uh, or the, the message that we're seeing in the media about how many people are actually uh, being impacted is much smaller uh, than what's really happening in reality. And I, I'm really concerned about people, um, you know, being deterred from exercising their right uh, to vote at the ballot box. Um, is there any, you know, is there any encouragement or any anything you would tell people who do have that fear? Um, you know, is there anything you would say to them to kind of reinforce the importance of, you know, soldiering on uh, because this work is so important? Right. It's a simple process that we're using here. We use it when we was trying to pass Amendment 4, right? You know, myself, I'm a returning citizen. I went to prison at the age of 15. The state of Florida sent more juveniles to adult prison than any other state in the country. And because I committed a crime, I got took out of the juvenile sent of offense for my very first offense and sent to prison. One of the things we did before Amendment 4 passed, we actually went out and we hired returning citizens to canvas those same community where most likely returning citizens will live in. And we just knocked on doors and shared our stories. And again, 90% of those doors we knocked on, you either had the person who opened the door as a returning citizen, or if you had a mother open the door, she had a son that was incarcerated, or you have the husband or you know, vice versa, someone in the house was directly impacted. And we just simply asked them, could they go out and vote on our behalf? And the same thing that we're doing this voting cycle, any returning citizen who is not sure that they can vote, you know, saying don't go vote. We don't want you to get in trouble, but we do want you to encourage four or five or even 10 of your friends and family members to go out and vote on, on your behalf. And if you have someone incarcerated who can't vote, go out and vote on their behalf. Even if you feel that this election is not important to you, you have many people who are incarcerated that can't vote and will love to vote and just go out and vote on their behalf. So we're just acting one to think of a loved one, think of a spouse or anyone that's in incarcerated and go out and submit a vote just on their behalf. I want to co-sign what Marquis said. Mm -hmm. um, there's organizations here, uh, the Transformational Prison Project in Massachusetts, uh, Project Turnaround. Uh, we had a whole facility called New Beginnings Reentry Center that I, is owned and operated by a Black woman who's a former uh, returning citizen, and she provided a home for Black women coming out of incarceration who are very active uh, in my election, but also being able to talk to people. People in the communities have the solutions. Um, it's not elected officials necessarily, or folks that we deem as leaders. These folks are already leaders returning back to their communities. Um, what we found is even the brothers of the AACC that I mentioned earlier are a powerful voting bloc. They talk to their families and friends all the time. And uh, in the previous election of our DA, who's now our US attorney, they actually held debates um, at the local facilities to encourage their families and they endorsed candidates uh, to make sure that their families and communities and neighborhoods and blocks that they left, they still have a huge influence um, an influence toward. And so I encourage that model and paying the frontline workers what they weigh. One of the things that we found uh, as many people came back into community um, you know, they're trying to find work and many of them have been disenfranchised, not only from voting, but from housing opportunities or work employment opportunities because of their quarries or stories. And we were paying folks uh, to go out and uh, canvas the community to educate them. And they provided valuable feedback. Our bills didn't, in most cases in the legislatures across the country, you got to get half and plus one or 10 to pass the bill. So congratulations to you in the state of Florida for passing Amendment 4. We've got a ways to go in Massachusetts. And I just wanna to share to people that are coming in from New York 
or the Northeast. We oftentimes talk about the South, but these problems are alive and well with Northern racism. And we turn a blind eye to them because so often we are looking at other states saying that they have bigger problems than us. And that is not the case. In every state in the United States, there's a problem with mass incarceration. We wouldn't have 2.3 million people and counting incarcerated across this country if that wasn't a problem that we're all facing. But using credible messengers or folks that are employed uh, to educate and steward uh, the Black vote and uh, the vote of formerly incarcerated people is important. And the other thing I'll share is we've got to stop talking about voting during elections only. <laughs> right? The laws that are implemented here in Massachusetts, we file laws in February. Uh, we file budget amendments in April. And we work all year for a year and a half um, in our, our terms to pass bills. There's over 7,000 bills uh, that are presented each year. And we maybe get to discuss 300 uh, to 500 of them in any given year. So that means that we need to be engaging with the electorate uh, even expanding the electorate 365 days a year. And that's one of the biggest challenges. If you talk to people only when you need their vote, um, they're not going to vote for you. Not only that, they're not going to show up at the polls. But if you talk about it all year around, folks are understanding why it's important to vote early, vote by mail, or vote on election day, because they're well prepared and engaged. Well, thank you for that. And and I do want to flag, you know, Rodrisha was having some internet issues and wasn't able to come back on, but we will definitely um, work to have her back on in a future show because I know she has so much valuable information to share. And I will say, <laughs> uh, Representative Miranda, when uh, you mentioned uh, the comparison between the South and the North, that there were a lot of folks that co-signed that. And I will say this, you know, serving in the Urban League movement, part of the reason the National Urban League was established is because all that um, Black folks and other people of color were fleeing in the South, whether it be Jim, Co Jim Crow, the Black Crow Codes, or any level of disenfranchisement, when they found that they made it to the North and the West, uh, what they found was not a promised land at all. I mean, uh, racism is entrenched in our society, and it's why the Urban League was established, really to treat, to create spaces and opportunities for employment, education, housing uh, in the North, um, really because folks found that a lot of the challenges that they were fleeing in the South were right here in the North as well. So I do think it's important when we are talking about this issue Yes, we need to be advocating on the state level, but this is a national problem. And so I'm just thankful to both of you uh, because not only are you doing the work where you are, but you are making sure that we lift it up on a national level. Uh, and I think it's important, uh, the point that you laid out about not just talking about voting and civic engagement when it's election time, because when we're doing it then, sometimes it's too late. We need to really be engaging with elected officials like you, Representative Miranda, and so many others early on. The question really should be uh, whether you are someone that has been in the system, someone that has been impacted by the system. I mean, I think we'd be hard pressed to find anyone in our families or communities that haven't been impacted in some way, shape, or form. We should be asking uh, folks that are pursuing elected office or looking to be reelected where do they stand on ending felony disenfranchisement? That needs to be part of our conversation 365 days of the year, not just before November 8th. But I'm glad that we're having this conversation now because you know I was talking about it with family and friends and others. There are so many folks that are starting to hear more about returning citizens, but there is a whole class of people that don't know that in certain states, people are voting while they are incarcerated. And so we need to be educating the public about that. Because if, if you have someone in your family that might be in the system now and you don't know that they have the right to vote where they are or that they might be detained and still have the right to vote, I mean, that's where the communication is, right? From our families, from our communities, uh, from others. 
Um, sorry, I got a little bit on my soapbox, <laughs> but you all have been uh, sharing such great information. I just um, wanted to jump in there. I would love to hear from you both um, thoughts about how everyday citizens, people that may just be new and learning more about this issue, can get involved in advocacy. Um, you lifted up a, a couple of the organizations that you're working with, your own organizations, Marquise, um, but I would love to use this as an opportunity to, to share more information about how we can plug people into this work. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, as of now, we currently have 20 chapters across the county. Uh, you know, my goal as the organizing director by 2026 is to have a presence in every county in the state of Florida, which is 67 counties, right? Not only have a presence in every county, but also have a presence in almost every Department of Corrections in the state of Florida, because it's about all about educating. And if we're not educating and taking those necessary steps to have conversations, right, a, a lot of things, show, the polls are going to continue to show up slow. But not only that, I think one of the biggest things that we have to realize is accountability, right? Again, we talk about, you know, only educating or having conversation with our community around election time, but we got to start holding our elected officials accountable, right? To be honest with you, sometimes they feel like a lot of our elected officials who are running for office don't even care or they're scared to talk about helping return the citizens in public, where if they actually realize that they deep down talk about it and have conversations, they may be able to get elected over many other candidates because they're not scared to talk about their issues. So, you know, we also encourage everyone in the state of Florida, whether you're directly impacted, whether you're a supporter, if you want to be involved with Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, um, our doors are open, right? You know, we have it, some things where some organizations where they only want to help certain returning citizens if they don't have violent offenses, right? Um, but we open our doors to anyone who's been through the criminal justice system, whether you have a felony or a misdemeanor, if you want to get on the right track and you want to continue to go out and help us engage returning citizens, again, our doors are open because at the end of the day, if we want to create a just and successful society, we have to make sure that everyone has an opportunity. And it's even facts that when you give a returning citizen an opportunity to build part of the democracy, that's the less chance that they're going to reoffend. So we want to make sure that everyone that's going through the system, that they go through the system, and then they get a fair chance to build a part of society. I'm going to hire you for a consultant fee to help us <laughs> you know, here in Massachusetts because, you know, um, you know, I just think about how often folks in my state talk about Florida and your governor ever since he sent two planes of migrants uh, to our to our state and has been sending them uh, every month. But the idea is that there's a lot of good organizing. I'll just share that there are a couple of ways that I think that this happens. I think to co-sign uh, to having different chapters um, and connecting with each DOC facility in your state is really important. Here in Massachusetts, all 15 of the houses of correct, all 15 of the Department of Correction facilities are very different. Uh, one is a maximum prison, uh, a few are mediums, few are uh, have more lifers in them. And so there's a culture difference in a, a superintendent uh, who is in charge of that uh, prison that basically runs everything that happens there. So mm -hmm. there's no, it's not a monolith as well. The second, um, this idea of throwaway people, if people really knew uh, that there are a large population of folks returning back to society that don't look like the people that they think do jail time, they would think very differently about these people. As I mentioned earlier, I was the only Massachusetts legislature legislator with an incarcerated sibling. So of course, when I became a representative, I was going to visit my brother and then visiting my constituents and, and my neighbors, friends that I went to high school with and college with um, that were incarcerated. And one thing that I found was that folks were asking me, why would I be visiting so many prisons? And besides my brother being in one of them, I mentioned they're actually in the care and custody of the Commonwealth. We technically, as the legislature, actually have a lot of power over the Department of Correction. Of course, the governor, um, you know, appoints a commissioner, and she also hopefully will have a first woman governor will appoint the secretary of the executive office of public safety. But the legislature is really the group of people that are making the laws. And I mentioned earlier here in the, the chat that it was only 2000 
the year 2000 was only 22 years ago that we lost the ability for folks um, to organize and vote behind bars, even if they had a felony. And the reason why that happened is in the census, uh, folks that are incarcerated are counted in those cities and towns where they reside. But if you think about this, if they have the power to vote those people in and out of office when they haven't addressed their concerns as issues as residents of those cities and towns, many of them purple or red cities and towns here in the in the case of Massachusetts, because they're not in Boston. You know, they're in towns an hour away or two hours away. They have a lot of power. And so I believe that it was strategically done where 60% of the population in Massachusetts voted to disenfranchise mostly black and brown people that were residing in their town because they were in those prisons, but were not from those cities and towns. The cities and towns impacted by that were Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, and black communities and cities and towns that were majority and minority. Um, the last thing I'll say about this that I found that's very interesting in this piece is you can pass a law, but implementation really matters. Because passing the law is one part of the challenge. But if we're not actually changing the way uh, prisons work, or the folks that have been hired to ensure that incarcerated our incarcerated loved ones have access to the ballot, um, we're failing. Uh, our constituents. And so I hope that when I get into the Senate, I will be connecting with Democracy Behind Bars and all of the folks that worked with me on the jail-based voting bill to ensure that implementation is successful. So in 2023, uh, when we have elections come September and November, that the system is actually providing access to the ballot locally. We hope that their polling locations actually in these facilities or near these facilities so folks uh, can make this happen. Wow. Between the two of you, you have dropped so many gems this evening. I love the, the emphasis on credible messengers, right? As we were trying to educate people, being able to share our personal stories and experiences, I think is moving to so many other folks and we'll get more people engaged in the process and actually pursue uh, the opportunity um, to participate in democracy, because we know how much it affects everything. Uh, and then implementation. You're right, we can talk about this, uh, Representative Miranda, over and over again. We can talk about legislation that has been passed in, in different places and spaces, but if it's not actually happening in reality, right? If people are not actually being afforded the opportunity, then it's really, it's just, it's just words on paper. And so we all have a responsibility. I love how Marquise talked about accountability. We have to hold our elected officials accountable uh, and making sure that implementation occurs. And maybe some of that advocacy is around resources and making sure Department of Corrections and any other government body that is in charge with actually meeting out, you know, the decisions that were been made actually have the resources to do so. Um, so I think all these are important. And I think the last thing I'll lift up to me, which is the thread, whether we were talking about the governor of Florida on any whole host of issues or on this conversation is empathy, right? What we are talking about right now, or we are talking about human beings. Uh, we are talking about people in this country that are citizens. Um, you know, but for the grace of God, I'm sure all of us at some point in time have made a mistake, have not lived perfect lives, uh, and then to be stripped and then never have the opportunity um, to engage in society. Uh, I mean, I think that's the question we really need to ask for those who have not been supportive of making sure that all the citizens have a right to the ballot box. What's the bias there? You know, uh, is there is there a lack of empathy? And if there is, and I think we're starting to see it in this country, country whether we talk about critical race theory or people want to rewrite history and not understanding um, what has happened over the course of time that has impacted so many communities, I think that's a deeper issue that as we talk about advocacy, we do have to be really honest uh, about where people stand on this issue and why they stand where they stand on this issue. And so I just want to thank you both for 
joining the show and really educating me. I learned a lot. There's a lot that you all have been doing that I think is important that we kind of lift up and make sure we shine a light on. Um, but I do want to just give you each a minute uh, to give us some parting words. I think this is just scratching the surface. This is the first time we've had this conversation on Justice Now. And I want to make sure that we create opportunities and spaces to welcome you back uh, in to continue this conversation and continue it in actually other spaces within our Urban League movement, because there's so many people that really need to learn more about this issue. Uh, and so many people that I know, once they know more, um, will, I think, have, um, will be excited and really will want to engage in, in this advocacy. Um, so Marquise, I'll, you know, we'll go to you for a minute and then um, Representative Miranda, soon to be Senate <laughs> Senator Miranda, I'll have you close the Senate. Yeah, like, hey, girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think one of the very first things, you know, as a as the black community, or just as you know, people and all, we we have to learn how to love more, right? And you know, always treat people as human. And then not only that, I think we need to normalize voting. Right in the respect of our, you know, ancestors who passed away. Um, you know, sometimes people say voting is not important, and my simple response: if it's not as important as you think, why do you think they keep trying to stop us from voting? Right. But not only that, when you talk about the formerly incarcerated, right, I think we just have to, you know, continue to have our discernment and 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 be creative. Right. One of the things that you know I'm looking to do in the near future, um, and, you know, guys will is to hire organizers inside of the prison, right? Because if they're not going to allow us to change the system, right, are they going to give us a problem? Problem. One of the things that I realized that when you talk about creativity and you talk about talent, when you look inside of the prisons, you look inside of the jail, it's a lot of untapped talent, right? So having those individuals who's incarcerated to help us write policy that would impact them when they get out could be things that can really keep them educated and give them get them involved, right? Then you got a lot of people when they come down to voting, they overlook our communities because they talk about you know low propensity communities. I, I challenge them to change the way that they think, right? It's not low propensity community, it's high potential voters because if you go in those communities and you talk about issues that's mostly important to those individuals you got a higher chance that it would go out so i just encourage everyone to get involved right even though if it's not a candidate that you don't like right forget about the party party affiliations look at the issues and look at the candidates who are going to treat you as humans one of the things that we realize here in the state of florida and across the world that you can tell the difference between a public servant and a politician when a politician get involved, people's lives are at risk. When a public servant get involved, people have a better chance of being um, successful and thriving. So I just encourage people to elect public service and not politicians. Love that. Well said. <laughs> you pointing at yourself right there, Representative Miranda. <laughs> First, I want to shout out the National Urban League um, for a couple of reasons. One, using the digital space. Uh, to decolonize information is incredibly important. Our communities are not always going on Zoom meetings or showing up in spaces that they don't feel welcomed. And to use a platform that is free, that reaches so many people, even tonight, all of us, I'm from Massachusetts, you're from Florida, uh, the other young lady, I forget what state she's from, and wherever you're located, that increases the amount of participation across the country with a national organization. So first, thank you. Um, the second piece I was going to share was that as I think about this movement, uh, when you were talking about sort of folks looking at incarcerated people as throwaway people and thinking about empathy, I want to share two things. One is that just because people are progressive doesn't mean that they don't cause racial and class harm. And organizations like the Urban League, the NAACP. Wait, say that again. I think we want to hear that one more time from you. Just because people or organizations, I had organizations say that they're progressive doesn't mean that they don't cause racial and, and class harm. And, you know, I've been a Delta for 22 years. And a lot of our organizations, whether it's the Urban League, whether it's the NAACP, whether it's the Divine Nine, have had this good Negro um, issue with them uh, that I think has deeply, deeply divided our communities between uh, who we actually engage with, who we talk to, who we let into rooms, who we build tables for, um, just based on their sort of, um, whether they're too ghetto or too hood or too whatever, um, to be allowed in these spaces. And that has actually divided the Black community. And, you know, as a Black person who is as hood as can be, you know, I've celebrated that 
I've engaged with people in my community. And like you said, they told me that I lived in a low voting district. And when I was running, um, I was scared. I never did politics before. And I won against four men and had a record of over 10,000 people going out to vote. And that year, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, then DA, now U.S. Attorney Rachel Rollins, myself and my colleague Rep. Elugardo won. It was the first time in Massachusetts history in 2018 you know, 2018, we were we were the first colony. 2018, where four black women won in the state of Massachusetts, and so our people act and react and engage when we bring them into this space and listen to them. And so these uh, notions about who is a who is a black person that we should be listening to and or who should be involved is deeply hurting us, and we should. Uh, be working on including everyone and ensuring that our progressive allies, and here's my last church sermon of the evening. There are a lot of organizations that work on voting rights. Um, here in Massachusetts, uh, we have Common Cause, we have Mass Vote, and the other organizations that I mentioned. Folks are working in silos. Um, we should all organizations be voting on all progressive voting rights and voting enfranchisement for all communities. One of the big issues in Massachusetts as our income inequality grows, there are people that have nowhere to live. And the access to the ballot is compounded by the fact that they're either living in a shelter, uh, living in a DOC facility, or living on the street, or living couch surfing. And so we have to deal with these issues together intersectionally because the issue of housing deeply impacts voting rights. The issue of transportation and education impacts voting rights and vice versa. And so I hope that folks don't work in silos, that we look deep in our organizations to challenge the status quo. Um, we need us. And in order for us to have all of us fully participate, we have to be more inclusive organizations. That's not just about folks who are elected. I like that. Uh, I consider myself a public servant, but that's because I spent years as a community organizer. I wasn't sort of brought up to be a politician. And, and if it wasn't, I'm sad to say, I don't think if my brother was murdered in 2017, I don't think I'd be doing this work. I was an executive director of a good organization and I had a good life. And I thought I did everything right. I went to college, I came back to my community, I did good work. And losing my brother, Michael, was one of those moments in my life that I knew I had to demand more. And I think if all of us can reach within ourselves to know that there's a moment for us to demand more and better, not only from our elected officials, but from the wider sort of democratic, uh, you know, I folks who vote for other things, but democratic establishment, where we are the bedrock, you know, the average voter in this country is a 66 year old black grandmother. And we have a lot more people that aren't 66 year old black grandmothers that we need to involve. So thank you all for allowing me uh, to participate and learn a lot too. Well, thank you, Reverend Miranda, because you really were pre preaching on this call. I mean, this conversation has just really left me so full. Um, and, and it is important, your points about inclusion and really the coalition building and work that we have to do together within our community, within the diaspora, outside the diaspora, it's all connected. You know, we all, we have a rising tide lifts all boats. And so um, thank you both for your leadership. Um, and I, I just can't, I can't leave it there. You know, you brought up essentially the, a nod to the, the idea and thoughts about a talented tent. Well, really, talent to tent means access to opportunity, right? And so if we look to our community, our community are full of talented individuals that just need the opportunity and access. And sometimes that has been not denied to us at different spaces and places in our life. And I really do think it is a responsibility of on all of us to make sure that every single member of our community has the opportunity to live their fullest and, uh, and biggest lives and really be able to reach out um, and pursue all of their dreams. There is so much talent that we have 
uh, that really isn't getting the food uh, and the fertilization and everything it really needs to really thrive. So thank you both for your leadership. We absolutely will have you back. And thank you to everyone that has tuned in for this Justice Now conversation. We're talking about justice, but we're also talking about power. So let's do what we can to engage on this issue. Reach out. Uh, if you're interested in volunteering, you've had a whole host of different um, organizations that were shared during this call. We'll make sure we lift them up on social media and repost this for those who haven't had the opportunity to stay for the full conversation or want to roll it back because there are so many great gems as part of this conversation that you want to hear again. Um, please do what you can, be involved in this fight, and let's make sure we continue this conversation, not just before the election, but make sure we create this culture of civic engagement in our communities. Marquise, Representative Miranda, thank you both for joining us. Uh, thanks for everyone that's tuned in. Be well. Have a good night. Remember, the time for justice is always now. Bye.